Hello, I'm Emma Bruner, and this episode of Real Foot Forward is made possible by Buddy's Wrecker Service in Union City, Tennessee. Request the best and call Buddy's for all your auto needs. Today's guest is Scott Conger, Mayor of Jackson, Tennessee. This is Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, where every single week we talk about the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I've got a very special guest with me today, uh, Scott Conger, who is the esteemed mayor of Jackson, Tennessee, Um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, what it's like to lead during uh, a crisis as well as a little bit about the history of his family and, and Jackson and, and how he, how and why he became mayor. So welcome, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me this morning. So uh, take me back to the beginning. Tell me about your childhood. I know that you grew up um, in the uh, government offices of Jackson. Tell us a little bit about that. And you could go all the way back to, you know, 1850, I understand. Oh, so yeah. Tell us about that. So yeah, well, my great 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 grandfather, uh, P. D. W. Conger, was as mayor back in 1861 and 1871. Uh, those were one year terms back then. And then my my grandfather Bob Conger was mayor of Jackson from uh, 1967 to 1989. So my first uh, six seven years of my life were uh, were spent crawling around with what we now call the the old city hall um, and. Uh, getting to, to see firsthand. And one of, one of my most fond memories growing up was um, every Saturday, uh, my grandfather would come pick me up and we'd go to the library, read a bunch of books. And um, then we either go to fire station or the police station, one of the fire stations or the police station. So he could go check on his guys. Uh, then we go to the artesian wells downtown and uh, end up at Woolworths, which is interesting because where Woolworths was is now where City Hall sits. And so uh, that was our Saturday and uh, a lot of pictures of, you know, newspaper articles of campaign events when I was you know, unrolling stickers and, you know, being a part of all of that. So uh, that was, uh, that was interesting, you know, first few years of life. And then, you know, growing up, didn't, didn't think much about it um, and got to college and was planning on actually teaching um, secondary history is what I got my endorsement and my licensure in and went on two interviews and they needed a, an econ teacher at one school and needed something else in another school. I didn't have that certification, so I didn't get hired. Looking back, I'm so thankful because I'd have been an awful teacher. <laughs> but I <laughs> um, started working in higher ed and um, got interested in, in neighborhood organization and neighborhood association and interested in local politics and um, ran for city council when I was, gosh, I was I think 27. I ran for city council back in 2011 and uh, was elected. I got elected to a second term and then uh, life happens. Um, wife got pregnant with our second child and looked around the house we lived in and said, where are we going to put him? And so um, ended up having to move out of the district, resigned from the council, I think in 2017. Um, and then uh, ran for mayor and in 2019 and uh, had the, the honor and the privilege of serving since July of 2019. Yeah, and uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. You probably had a whole set of expectations of what was going to happen, as we all, you know, do and did. And then, boom, everything changed on a dime. So, but let's back up. Did you grow up in Jackson? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've grown up in Jackson. The only time I spent out of out of Jackson was uh, my three years at Ole Miss. And where did you uh, go to high school? Southside. Um, and which uh, group did you run around with? Which clique were you part of in high school? Oh God! Well, I played I played football and soccer, and um, but uh, I was I had a full time job also, so it was school practice. And I worked at Catfish Cabin out in South Jackson, so uh, yeah, I was working thirty so hours a week outside of football and soccer, and hung around with a few folks, mostly I guess the people I played sports with. But other than that, I was I was working. Um, and then where did you go to college? Went to Ole Miss, and then uh, so my mom and my grandmother both public educators. Um, my mom taught 32 years at Denmark elementary. And you know, the, the crazy thing is the doctor told her that she wore her neck out teaching elementary school. So she, uh, I was at Ole Miss. She called me one night, she was grading papers at home, looked up and I guess the dog barked or something, turned her head and, um, two, um, two vertebrae ruptured in her neck. And so she had neck surgery and she was 
my mom lives out in the country, has horses and dogs and small farms. So uh, she was by herself. So I moved home to help her out because back then it was the same surgery that that Peyton Manning had, but uh, we didn't have the means to go to Europe and do stem cell replacement and research and all that. So uh, she couldn't lift over five pounds for, I think, gosh, six months. Couldn't, couldn't ride in a car for three, couldn't drive a car for six months. So uh, moved home to help her out and then uh, did my last three semesters at Lane College and then went on and got my, my MBA from Bethel University. So when you were when you were first starting out, did you have any idea exactly what you really wanted to be when you grew up? I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> what, what, what were you looking for in a college? What what made you pick Ole Miss? Um, well, you know, is you know, many guys make a great decision on their college as a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, went there and, and girl didn't even end up going there. But I had some friends that went there and uh, it loved it, uh, made some lifelong friends. And um, but really, you know, I think, you know, God has a plan for all of us. And I think coming to Lane College, uh, I ended up working at Lane after I graduated uh, for about five years. And so it gave me um, some very unique perspectives on things. Um, I was a recruiter when I first started, so I got to travel the country, uh, recruit on behalf of Lane College. Uh, then worked in the finance department and then went on to nonprofit. And before I became in this position, I was CEO of United Way of West Tennessee. So, you know, serving 14 counties across the, the region. So uh, as a recruiter, you know, you talk to a lot of a lot of young people looking for colleges. I know some of our listeners have kids who are looking for colleges. What, you know, a lot of people gravitate towards those bigger schools, you know, and, and I personally, now that I've moved to a more rural community, I'm seeing a lot of benefit to some of the uh, smaller colleges in these communities. What do you think the benefits are to a college like Lane? Well, you know, I think coming from, coming from Ole Miss and then going to Lane, um, I, I told folks that when I was at Ole Miss, and I was a history major, English minor. And so some of our, my literature classes were, you know, 250 students. And so you're, you're nothing really but a number and a person in the seat. Going to a smaller college uh, after that, um, th- there wasn't many history majors. And so uh, in my upper level research seminar classes, there were two of us. And so you get that, that small classroom feel. Uh, your professors know your name. Administration knows your name. Uh, you're, you're more than just um, a tuition payment. Um, you're actually, you know, you're a person, they care about you. They foster those relationships and cultivates that. And I think that's the same thing, you know, across our, our smaller colleges. Uh, Bethel was the same way. Um, I did my, my graduate work mostly online. Uh, but, um, you know, going and, and graduating my professors that were in my online professors, cause there are only you know, 20 so of us in the classroom. They, they knew who we were. And so it was, uh, you know, having that small college feels a unique experience it helps cultivate those relationships. So at some point in the back of your mind was, I might like to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. Was that early on? Did it come later? When, when did you start thinking that might be a possibility? Oh, man. Um, pro- probably I was, I was working at Lane, and um, I was getting, getting interested in not so much you know, national and state politics. Is really, you know, if you look at it, all politics are local. Um, local governments – those decisions made here have a far greater impact on our everyday lives than, than anything that, that the president or Congress does. And um, so I started following you know, that and, and just having that, I guess, innate interest um, with my family history and getting involved in the neighborhood organization here and, and seeing how, how that representation from city council members to the mayor's office really affects, you know, how we live. And so that's, that sparked my interest. And, um, and saw an opportunity to, to run for city council and, and did so and, and had the great opportunity to get the experience to serve on the council. Um, you've got a beautiful wife and two great kids. Um, at what point did you uh, get married and along that path? Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I was, you know, ask me question down timelines. I got to think about <laughs> April has been the longest year of my life. So I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess my, my wife and I met right before I ran for, for city council. And so, uh, she, uh, she got the trial by fire. We weren't married yet. We were engaged uh, my first year and a half or so on the council. And then, um, my daughter is four and my son is two. And so, uh, they, um, yeah, they, they have, you know, it's, it's interesting. Kids humble you very much. I, I tell the story of my first election day because we had a runoff election last year. So I had two election days. 
first election day, we had it at the Double Tree Hotel, and, and my wife Nikki had a had a great idea. In theory, it was, it was fantastic. Let's get a room at the Double Tree. That way, we can get ready there, go down, have the election watch party, come back up. So I get done working the polls, come there, change clothes. My kids are finally asleep. Uh, son wakes up right before I go down when the polls close at seven, I think. He wants to stay with mama. That's fine. So I go downstairs, watch party, no kids, no wife. Uh, early voting comes in, first two boxes come in. So we got one set of boxes to come in before the, the final results. No, no kids, no wife. She calls me. Uh, I need you to come here right now. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a big night right now. Uh, and so as soon as I get off the elevator, I hear screaming from the room. Uh, and they're, both my kids are screaming, crying. My daughter wakes up from her nap, not in a good mood. Son is one at the time, is tries to give her a hug. She bites him on the arm. My wife has to spank her, so now they're both crying. We get them together, fine, they go downstairs, make the speech, go back, they go upstairs, I get everything cleaned up and come back upstairs, and she's packing up everything. And so, she, you know, we're going home, daughter's crying, wants to go home, son got overexcited, jumping on the bed, vomited on the bed, so we're just, <laughs> We're just going home. So at 10.30, we're checking out of a hotel room, going back home after uh, I just won the first round of election. I thought, these, your kids have a way of homely. They don't care. Dad is dad. Doesn't matter what he does. Right. Absolutely. And it takes, <laughs> it takes a lot of time to, do, to, to parent. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that in, in a minute, about how you manage your time. But um, <clears throat> your, your campaign for mayor, how, how, did, how does it go about when you're trying to decide to run for mayor you need a platform to run on. I know that yours was transparency, efficiency, and inclusion. Um, how did you come upon that? Um, and how important was that to your campaign? Yeah, you know, I think for, for anyone running for office, being true to yourself and authentic is, is the best way to go. If you, if you try to create something, then eventually, no matter how well you practice it, people are going to see through it. And, and that's transparency, inclusion, and efficiency are something that I've, I kind of live my life on. Um, you know, what I've done in the nonprofit world, anything I've done is including people being transparent, being efficient. And so those are just very seamless as a seamless platform for me. Um, and, and I think people it resonated because it was authentic. It's, it's what I believe in, what I continue to believe in. And those are the questions that we still ask every day here. If, if we come up with an idea or, or talk about doing something, it is the process transparent. Are we including people and is it the most efficient way to do it? Uh, I think that's the way we have to to run any business, especially a government. And then, uh, how do you tackle? How do you? How do you? Most most of us out here talk, listening to you right now have never run a campaign or have never been in a campaign. Um, where where do you start? And and how do you? How do you? You obviously won, so you 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 know how to do it. How, if I wanted to run for mayor, how how would I do it? Well, yeah, I think I think everybody's path is is unique. Um, and I think what, what we did, uh, in our, our campaign was something that I don't think that has been done in this region, maybe the state, I, I don't know about the other parts of the state, but we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, so you know, I started out talking with people, uh, having those conversations and, um, utilizing social media. And so, you know, to give you an example, one of my, one of my opponents spent about $200,000 um, and from, for the May election date, we spent about $55,000. Um, and so we, we utilize social media and just having those creating videos, having conversations, you know, like I said, going back to being authentic on, on who I am talking about what I see for Jackson, what the possibilities are, how we can, how we can be better. Um, and knocking on doors, making phone calls. Um, I had two sets of, of town hall meetings that were in every part of the city, uh, getting people and just meeting people where they are and, and having those genuine conversations about what people want to see out of their city and, uh, and, and what we can do and how we can collaborate and how we can bring people to the table. And we, we've worked to do that. Um, you know, we just got some data reports from our, our board appointments of so the, the volunteer boards and commissions. We've appointed um, twice the number of new board appointments as we have reappointed people. So we're bringing more people to the table to be involved in those processes. So I wonder uh, what role in your in your early campaign and and I, I know I know the role that it has in your administration. What role did social media and and digital communication have early on? Oh, it, it was that was the cornerstone uh, because you can reach 
so many people so much more effectively um, than, you know, you look at social media, our ads were eight cents per CPM. So per cost per, uh, for person seeing it was eight cents. You know, that's, you get into advertising and social media, you can target a demographic, you can target a section, I could target just the city of Jackson, people that live here. Uh, you get into TV, radio, newspaper, that's going, that's a shotgun widespread approach. Uh, so you're paying for people that aren't going to even have the opportunity to vote for you to see it. And so uh, I think social media allows, has allowed and keeps allowing me to engage with people. Um, and then break down that barrier of city hall. I think that, you know, no matter what we think of, of mayors and our elected officials have kind of removed and, and we don't really have that direct access. And that's one thing that, that I work very hard on is to, to continue to provide that direct access and be able to communicate with people and answer questions. And, um, you know, even the, the unpleasant comments come along with it. So, um, your administration can probably d- be divided into two phases now, pre-COVID and post-COVID. So I don't even know it, if there is any pre-COVID anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> was was there anything in those few months? You know, you, you definitely, you know, you had a vision for what you were going to do and where you were going to head. And so you got started down that path. Was there anything you learned in that short period? Anything that surprised you about being mayor? Um, well, I think... I think my time served on the council gave me a lot of insight on, on how government works. Um, you know, there, there were some surprises. You know, there always are some surprises you don't know. Um, for us, you know, we, we were uh, the, the last administration passed a budget that was essentially a continuation budget. So there was no, there's not a lot of time and thought process into how the dollars were being allocated and spent, where the revenues were coming from. So we had to really learn on the go on, on what we had, where it was being spent, how to spend it correctly. And so what I think that did for us is allowed us to get that in-depth financial knowledge coming into to COVID, knowing that um, we lost about $4 million in revenue this past fiscal year. We're looking at about a three and a half million dollar shortfall uh, this coming fiscal year. Uh, it allowed us to, to budget more conservatively uh, to drive that efficiency that we, we talked about for a year and a half during the campaign and uh, getting our, our sales tax numbers yesterday. Um, we, we did plan for worst case scenario. Uh, but I think that worst case scenario is going to be mitigated by by the buying power and the buying habits of people. Um, but knowing that we came into a tough situation, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't the greatest situation. There were a lot of uh, financial hurdles to overcome, and so I think that helped prepare us for the extreme financial hurdles that we're seeing now. Um, before we shift into COVID talk. Uh, it feels to me like just um, as somebody who talks to a lot of people from this region, there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurial spirit in Jackson and there's a lot of um, arts and culture happening. What do you think those type things, um, how do they benefit a community, arts and culture and, and, and a good community spirit? How does that benefit a town like Jackson? those are all quality of life aspects. I mean, you have, if you don't have that, if you don't have people bought into where they live, um, then they're not going to care as much. And, and the more people buy in, the more people um, feel included, then that just brings up that community pride, uh, the care in their community. You see people taking care of their neighborhoods better, um, wanting to spend more time in Jackson, wanting to visit local businesses. We have those entrepreneurs here that are taking those risks um, and and you know, it's been a hard time for them during during this COVID pandemic of uh, having to shut down for you know five or six weeks. Um, but really pushing that once we open back up to to spend money with your local businesses. These people are taking risks. They're hiring people. Um, but having that community pride is 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 paramount to making sure that you have a successful city, successful community, um, and, uh, and getting people employed, increasing their buying power, and increasing their economic situation. Uh, and then, you know, rising tide raises all ships. And so you know, we started a, a public art initiative that got put on pause. Um, we had one mural that we started last year, finished, did a small mural. And, and we're including people from all walks of life. We had a, and she was nine years old that did a mural for us. And so now we're, we're working on our third mural that's going on right now. And it's trying to pick our public art initiative back up and, uh, you know, beautify our city, beautify our downtown and, and make it a destination spot. Um, so let's switch to COVID. Um, where were you, or do you remember when you first started to hear that, that, that this was blooming and there might be a problem ahead? Yeah, I was on a cruise. Uh, <laughs> not a good place to be. 
it was, uh, you know, mid February and, um, uh, my family was, we, we took a, a short cruise and, uh, we were, we were just talking about it with, um, uh, with the, the dining staff, uh, the waiter were kind of asking him, you know, we'd heard about it in the news. And so we were asking him about how that, how that was impacting their business. And, and they were letting us know that, you know, their future reservations were being canceled and they were losing reservations just because of the uncertainty. Um, and then, so we get back and, and we're, we're watching the news consistently. Uh, I can remember I me mean, March 16th was, um, was our first local task force. And we organized, <clears throat> I got our chamber together, our energy authority, uh, city, county, emergency management, health department, school system, and uh, United Way. We all got together and started meeting about how, what this will look like, how we can tackle it, how we can best serve everyone, how we can, it's all back to that inclusion piece of knowing what everybody's doing and how we can better serve people. Um, you know, our first declaration of emergency was on uh, March 17th, I believe. And then we started meeting daily um, about our numbers, about what we're doing as a, as a community. And so everything that we have done from executive orders to, to stay at home orders, safer at home, mass mandates have all been by committee of that committee making that decision. So, you know, no, no person is on an Island making this decision by themselves. We're all working together and, and do what we feel is best. Hospitals also includes in that. I think I left them out. It's uh, um, got to be challenging because there are so many different opinions on uh, what is the, really? <laughs> <laughs> what is the right thing to do? Um, you know, how are you and your team, uh, you know, vetting all those ideas and you know you're getting input from every area imaginable you know yeah. and a lot of a lot of decision making has been left up to mayors and um um in some cases governors how uh how, how are you doing it well you know we're we're fortunate here that we have a phenomenal health department we have a metro health department that serves just Madison County so we're able to to focus on Jackson Madison County uh, we have West Tennessee Healthcare that has Jackson Madison County General Hospital here. So we, when, when it comes to the the health aspect, those are who we lean on. Um, and, and we've been very honest from the start of this. This is a novel virus. Um, we're learning with everybody else. And so what we thought back in March was the best approach since information has evolved, then uh, our approach has to evolve. Uh, and so, but we, we, we solely depend on the, from the health aspect from our health department, who's in communication with the CDC, who's in communication with the state health department, from our hospital system, uh, who are, who are treating these people, uh, who are coming in. And, uh, you know, yesterday, uh, we had 82 people in our hospital that, um, were COVID positive. Um, and of those 82 people, you know, only 13 were Madison County residents. And so, you know, what we are dealing with outside of Madison County is just the regional impact of COVID-19 because they're going to come to our hospital um, because there's the, the rural hospitals are not there anymore from uh, failure to expand Medicaid. Um, and so rural hospitals see the closure. So now we are, we're the catch all for that acute care. You have the unique um, situation of being able to look back on your grandfather's uh, time as mayor. Is there anything that he went through that was comparable to what you're going through now? You know, I don't think there's anything that anyone's gone through that's comparable to, to a global pandemic. Um, I, my, my uncle turned 90 uh, beginning of this month and he and I were talking and I said, you know, you're, you're 90 years old. That's you've, you've lived a while, but even you haven't seen something like this. Uh, you know, the last global pandemic we had to this level was was 1918. And so um, there's no playbook. Uh, there's, you know, there's nothing that we can look back to and go, okay, this is step one, step two, step three. Uh, we're, you know, I really paint the ship as we go along and, and being nimble and evolving and, and how we approach it is, I think has been the key to, to mitigating the, the catastrophe that could be, uh, you know, we, we're seeing our numbers rise now, but I think if, if we haven't been proactive from the start and, and doing things, and I think it could be a lot worse than what it is. So let's talk about social media again a little bit. So you've really embraced it during this time, unlike any other mayor that I'm even familiar with in big cities or, or um, and I even tune in to your Facebook uh, town halls, I guess you have from your desk there. Um, yesterday, uh, you released um, a really great video that was sort of <laughs> like a mean tweet, you know, but um, so um for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, Luke is going to play just a little clip of that. 
So this comes from the July 3rd post about the, the mask mandate. Um, so we'll start. This is All you're doing is weakening your immune system with these masks. You know what weakens your immune system really is getting COVID. Next comment. That. I don't even know what to say. Next comment. You. Heard that a few times. Scott Conger, you are essentially boating yourself out of office. Keep it up. I don't know how to boat myself out. I usually only get one vote during the election. Go ahead and send me a fine for no mask. I haven't worn one from day one, and I'm not going to start now. Okay, that was really funny. My wife watched it. She, you know, we loved it. What What is that like to be working so hard and trying to, you know, lead and have people who either don't have all the information or who have very uh, strong opinions basically taking pot shots at you? You know, what, what's that like? Well, yeah, yeah, luckily, uh, I learned a very long time ago from my grandfather, you got to have thick skin to, to do this job. And uh, it, we find the humor in it. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that, um, that I think it's a great thing. It's unfortunate for us because we're trying to protect people. Uh, but it's the great thing about our country is people can have different opinions. They can express them um, and, and they have the right to do that. And uh, you know, the accessibility that we have is can sometimes be a double-edged sword because we get a lot of the, a lot of the blame, a lot of the, the uh, negative comments, but that's just part of it. If, if I wasn't accessible, then I wouldn't hear the good and the bad. So it's, you know, you got to take both of them in stride. So most, most people in politics, um, even if they have very sincere reasons to be in politics are not as forthcoming as you are um, with what's in their mind. So what, why do you feel like you have the freedom to say to people, look at what I just said. You know, I, mean, I mean, you know, you're able to, I mean, I think one of my favorite things that you said was uh, Snoop Dogg is scheduled to come to Jackson. If y'all can't stay home and stop spreading COVID-19, Snoop Dogg ain't coming. So what, what, why do you feel the freedom to be able to say what you think? Well, I mean, I, I, it goes back to, to that authenticity that, that we ran on about being transparent. Um, I am who I am. Um, and um, I think, you know, if, if we put up a barrier of ourselves and we never get to know each other. And um, I think it's important for, you know, elected officials to be seen as people because that's what we are. And, um, you know, we're not, most of us aren't robots. There may be some that are. I don't know. But <laughs> there might be. Yeah, and I think having humor. This is like I said, un unprecedented. You no, know, we haven't seen this in in the world in 102 years. And so, uh, being able to have some fun, um, you know, be direct with people, uh, and that's what I've told people on, on several times. If if you get offended by what's being said here or, or my responses to people, then I'm sorry. But you know, this is my time. I'm working. You know, it was back then. It was 16, 18 hours a day on COVID and city things and, you know, taking an hour out of the day just to kind of cut loose and have fun and um, interact with people is, is what kept me going outside of my family. So, um, you know, sometimes I would get home, they'd all be asleep. So it's, you know, this is my only time to interact with folks. And, but um, I think most people enjoy it. I, I enjoy it. And it's, um, it's important to, to show people who you are uh, and, and be authentic. So, you know, people can't, I want people to see me out on the street. You know, I walk to the gym every day at, at lunch and I'm, I want be able, people to see me and go, Hey, you know, I can go talk to him. He's not, I don't want the title of, of what I've been elected to, to interfere with, with who I am. Well, it is interesting to see people's comments on the, on those Facebook things <laughs> and, you know, scroll through and see where, because it is hard to get a gauge, you know, on where people are sometimes. And oftentimes the loudest voice is the one you hear, but that's not always, you know, the consensus. Yeah. Um, a lot, some of the folks listening may be uh, leaders in other organizations or in, in other, other places. What, what have you learned so far? Have you even had a chance to stop down and think of what have I learned so far about leadership in a time of crisis? Uh, there's a saying, um, um, let me see where that saying is. There's a saying, oh, an English proverb, cometh the hour, cometh the man, um, you know, or woman, I think we would add right. today. Yeah. But um, it's, it's, speak, it's really referring to Winston Churchill, 
Um, and there's a lot of Winston Churchills I know that have risen to the top through this time. What, what, what have you learned about leadership during this time? I mean, I think we being, being nimble, being able to, to have your opinion change very quickly, uh, because with all this, their information changes and, um, we can't be so set and principled in our ways that no matter what I think is going to, what's going to happen, uh, we have to be able to evolve and adapt. And I think adaptability is, is one thing that, um, that I have learned patience. I mean, this first year has really taught me patience from coming from essentially a staff of, of, of six that oversaw <clears throat> with an organization that if I wanted something done, I could get it done within that week. Um, you get an organization where we have 600, 750 employees. Um, you're dealing with a lot bigger um, budgets and issues. And so it's a, um, it's a bigger machine that doesn't, it's not as nimble and not as flexible. And so uh, being able to do things when I want to do them, especially with COVID now, um, the, the ideas and the projects that we had and the, the things we wanted to work on got, got put on pause. And so, um, having those, having that patience to understand that you got to deal with the crisis in front of you, but the other things still going on, you got to, got to make a plan for them as well, knowing that they're not going to happen exactly when you want them to happen. Uh, but knowing still keeping your goals in mind while you're dealing with what's in front of you. So when this is all over with, what, what are you and your family going to do to unwind? Uh, I think my wife wants us to go on a trip. <laughs> so, um, we will probably do that at some point whenever, um, it's safe to do that. Uh, I just, um, I told her the other day we were actually talking about it and I said, I just, I, I don't feel comfortable uh, going anywhere outside the city. I don't feel comfortable going on a trip, uh, for two reasons. I don't want to leave, um, leave Jackson right now and, and leave, um, this seat empty for, for a few days. And then, uh, I don't want to unnecessarily expose my family um, that we don't have to be exposed. So when it's over with, I'm headed to the beach. I don't know. Is that? I mean, it may be January. We may just head to the beach and just put our <laughs> put jogging suits on and just go sit on the sand. <laughs> yes. Agreed. So that was going to be my last question. What? What? This is not going to be over, obviously, for years and the impact. And we're all going to be you know, cleaning this up and dealing with it. the world has changed for all of us forever. Um, how long do you think it'll be before we get to some semblance of what life was like before? That's a great question. Um, I have no clue. Um, you know, I've, we, I'm, I'm talking with our, our venue uh, directors, the people that rent our venues, you know, they're, they're looking at some of their events, you know, September, October, November and, and asking my opinion. And I, I tell them, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next week. Uh, let alone what's going to happen uh, two or three months down the road. Um, I think it all depends on, you know, if a vaccine is um, developed and it's effective um, and what we can do, because you're looking at not only just COVID right now, we're getting, you know, we're, what, four months away, three months away from flu season. And so there's, there's a lot of concern there. Um, but I think if, if we can do the, take the proactive measures now of, of wearing face coverings, washing our hands, social distancing, uh, then I think we can we can really mitigate the spread of this virus, and um, we can get back to some semblance of of normalcy sooner than later. But I don't know what sooner is rather than later. Right, I don't either, but I hope it's soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for all you do, um, and thank you for your um, honesty and your Facebook uh, posts and your picture of you with your mom. Um, on the ski lift thing. That was awesome. So thanks. Thanks for all the, thanks for the moments of levity during this time. Um, and for being, um, on our podcast. No, thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.